When the enemy comes against you like a flood, when all hell breaks out of you, when all of a sudden in a, in a moment everything is just completely outrageously not the way you want it to be, when you feel threatened, when you're overwhelmed, the Bible says something very simple. It says, having done everything, stand. And to be able to stand and work your faith when you have no knowledge of when, how this could ever be changed. So David in his Psalms gave us a couple of ideas on how to empower ourselves to be able to stand. Because most of us, let's face it, even as Christians, we can, you know, a lot of people right now wouldn't come to a nighttime service. You came, so there's some, there's some action in you where you're able, instead of just drowning in your own self-pity, or quitting in your own frustration. You did something to move towards God. And when you move towards God, believe me, God recognizes that and moves greatly towards you. But everything is going to be a test of faith. Of Are we working our faith? And can we not just believe God, can we trust God when everything is a mystery? But you see, God says in, in Romans chapter 1, because they knew God, but did not honor God as he is, he sent darkness into their hearts. You don't want God to turn the light off. That's not the devil that takes it. The devil might have seduced people to change their image of God. But this is why it's so important to, to understand grace and mercy is a person. In his presence is the fullness of joy, which is the opposite of being full of guilt and shame. And when you're in that joy, Nehemiah says in 810, the joy of the Lord is your strength to be able to do what God wants you to do, not what you want to do to save yourself. Remember, the more you try to save yourself, the more you will lose yourself. What you have to do is play dead and allow God to live his life through you. That's the deal we have with him. So the more you take your hands off, the more you trust God, the more you trust God, the more you're going to see a lot of these miracles that we've been experiencing. Because only God can create a miracle. And our plan to save ourselves will always be a dead end street. Amen. And the very, very least will happen is you'll go around and around the same mountain over and over again, over and over again, because you just don't get it. Now, I believe that God's grace for salvation is so great, as I've been preaching, he puts you in the, 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 the padded cell of grace, and you run like crazy and bound into the wall so that you don't hurt yourself and many other people while he's working his process on you. Some of it's a short term. Some people, it's a lifetime. They never get it. Amen. So what we want to do is have a few clues, not from a book other than the Bible, but from the word of God on how to be able to stand when you almost want to put a gun in your mouth or you want to shoot somebody else. OK, or you want to run and hide or you want to curse or you want to punch a hole in the sheetrock when you finally get when the devil knows where your last nerve is. Amen. OK, when all hell breaks out, stand. Paul tells us in Ephesians to be strong and stand against the trickery of the devil. A better word is the seduction of the devil. Remember, in any circumstance you have, you got to look past the personality that you're blaming and attack the principality that is using the foolish personality. If you take the bait, you will have resentment and bitterness and you'll attack the person and you, you, you're taking all of your energy attacking something that's not your problem. So remember, behind every issue that you have that's horrible, there is a principality being effective to you because you're taking the bait of, 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 of taking and triangulating, as we call it in psychology, you're triangulating to a person and ignoring the devil. You have no power and authority over a person. That'll just bounce back and you'll be full of resentment and bitterness and you destroy yourself and you destroy your potential. You have total authority over the devil. So we have, to, we have to be reminded of that, that when we get in trouble, we start blaming some person 
for our life. And even if that person is you, you're blaming yourself when it really is a demonic spirit. And remember again, all power and authority was given to Jesus and then he delegates us to us. But first you got to be able to believe that if he gave you power over demons, there's such things as demons. But right now we just think all people are no good. David said at one time, he says, I got to the point where I said all men are liars. Yeah, and, and women too. Okay. So what happened is he took his mind off the enemy and he was looking at people. And what happens, you implode and you begin to feel sorry for yourself because you feel powerless against people. And the fear of people is the beginning of a trap. All right, so we want to start that. And so Paul is saying there comes a definite point in our Christian experience when all hell comes against us, we must realize and accept God has already done, God personally has already done what he's going to do. And he's asking you now to stand in faith of why he did all he's going to do. So God already gave us his son. God gave us his spirit. God gave us his word. He gave us grace, mercy, and authority over the demonic realm. And there's nothing more God will do. We are expected to stand in both faith and trust. You can't please God without faith. And that faith must be tested. So we have faith by grace to believe God is who God says he is and he can do anything. But it's that it doesn't affect us as instantaneous in the way we want it to do. So we buy back our faith and we go to, to, to handle it ourselves. Do we understand that? How many people know most of us react in fear over everything? Anger is only fear turned outward. And fear is only, uh, only uh, pregnant in your life to devour you by unresolved issues from childhood that's never been dealt with and never been conquered. So anytime you feel threatened or intimidated, you're going to defend yourself by anger. And that anger is nothing going to, it's going to destroy you and relationships and your relationship with God. And God says, okay, take another lap around the same mountain again. He doesn't abandon you. He just sends you on, a, on your pilgrimage again, and we're going to try it again, okay? And if you keep taking the bait, you're going to repeat that your whole life. And many people do. So we have fully believe in deliverance, in healing, in, in counsel, in wise instruction, but sometimes after people come and explain the situation, I would say, you must stand in faith, work your faith, believe God's promises. Right. Amen. And then I wrote, most struggling believers don't want to hear that. They didn't come to hear. They didn't come for me to tell them that because they expected that I should take out my little magic King James wand, hit them on the head, spin them around a couple of times. And like Tinkerbell, they fly around delivered from everything that I have some magic potion. I have some special words to deliver you. Abracadabra in the name of Jesus, be thou made free. But what my message is to do is to point them back to the starting point, Christ Jesus, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. The word was a lamp unto your feet. The power of the Holy Spirit that can take a dead Jesus, made him alive and ever and, 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 and where he ever lives interceding for you. Amen. That power is in you. Amen. Not in the words of a counselor. Because you have the counselor, the comforter living in you. But you frustrate the grace of God. You frustrate the Holy Ghost because you go back to this demon possessed, worn brain of yours trying to figure what you're going to do next. Because God is old, you know, he doesn't work quick enough. So there are also some situations that can only be changed by the supernatural healing or supernatural deliverance. But there are other occasions in which God requires a person only to stand. The highest thing I think God can do for you is when he allows the enemy to attack you like Job 
and then gives you a command to stand. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Just stand and know that God Almighty was not surprised by this. God Almighty is in this. And he doesn't want you to defame him or think that he's not good of a job. That's the highest level you can get. Now, I was in, in my little room back there, I had uh, uh, my three great grandchildren from Morgan and Ryan. And then we had the uh, a little Youngsville refugee, Joey, in there with us. And uh, he's, he's, a, he's just in the bunch with all the rest of us in the back there. And, you know, the youngest one, the little uh, uh, Daniels, he, he's eating everybody else's food. You know, and the mama have kept going. And the other ones were just, you know, either intimidated or whatever. They just let him grab that stuff, you know. And Morgan had to shake his hand. When they're little like that, you got to do everything for them. You got to wipe their nose. You got to do. You got to do all kinds of horrible stuff when they're little like that. You got to. They they, they, you, they can't do anything for themselves. But after a while, pick that up. You know, well, quit doing that. You, 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 go brush your teeth. Your breath, you know, a little, as, as you grow older, more and more, you're supposed to mature. So after a while, God's tired of picking up your dirty drawers behind you, you know, and says, hey, hey, put on your robe of righteousness. Why don't you grow up right now? Why don't you, why don't you speak a word out of, out of, you know, why, why don't you fight that devil? Why don't you do something? So he allows you. And then finally, the highest level again is when he really trusts you. And I want you to know, there's been many times I said, God, why am I in this situation? Because he says, I trust you. And I said, God, I love you, but I don't think you should trust me this much. I really don't think I should be trusted in this. Because I'm about ready to blow up. I tell you what, I about had it. But it is where we're going. We go from faith to faith, glory to glory. We are supposed to be maturing, not changing, being transformed. Amen? Amen. Let me help you. All of us came to Jesus as a train wreck. And now that we've been saved a long time, our natural person is still a wreck. So it's not so much that we're going to change as the person we are, but our spirit can transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Yes. Where we can become living epistles that people in darkness can come and ask of the hope that they see in you. But not if you're still playing around the mountain over and over again with the, the noonie in your mouth and your pampers full and you just go round and round again whining and crying all the time. All right, throw both hands up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you mad right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you permission. Grow me up. That's an example. We start infantile, born again. Goo goo, da da, da da, hold me, da da, pray for me, love me, instruct me, reveal to me, deliver me. And after a while, God says, hey, I did everything I'm going to do for you. Why don't you start being a speaking spirit that is speaking the promises of God? Why don't you take the authority I gave you and why don't you do something about your enemy instead of letting him plunder you? Why don't you quit being a captive? Why don't you start being a deliverer and set captives free? So God requires a person only to stand. We are expected to move from faith to faith into maturity. That is why Paul said four times, stand therefore. Stand. stand. What do I do? Stand. stand. But like Popeye, yeah, but I can't stand no more. Okay, I got to do something. You know, it's like when I was in the fifth grade, a guy showed me a cartoon. There were several buzzards in a tree. And, and one buzzard said to the other one, if something doesn't die, I'm going to kill something. <laughs> Understand it? We, have, we get to the point where we, we can't wait anymore. God, God's, not, God's not at it. He's not taking me serious. He, he's not doing what he's, I thought he would do. And that's the big problem. He's not doing what we think he should do. 
when he should do it and how he should do it. And then his great order is, I got a plan for you. All hell is coming against you in every way. I want you to stand. Well, hell, that don't make no sense to me right now. Well, you know, salvation was free. Is that right? Yeah. You had grace for that. But now you're in a situation now that if you're going to move, it's obedience. It's no longer just forgiveness. Now it's obedience. Or you're going to do what he says to do. It's hard to obey God if you don't know what he wants you to do. But most of us, all of our prayers is, oh, do something. oh God, oh God. And you're screaming so loud, you can't hear the still small voice. Now, how about we decide we're going to learn how to stand? Because if we have to stand when all hell's coming out against us, then we ought to know how. Is that right? Okay. There are also situations that can only be changed by the supernatural. Give me the next slide here. When seemingly all hell comes out against you, and let's face it, it's not all hell. It's some little pee-pee demons. God doesn't let all hell come. Just, a, just, just some of them that just got off their training pants. And, it, it, you know, because he, he lets you fight the little devils. You know, David said, first I, I killed some mice, and then I kicked an armadillo, then I moved up to a coyote, and then I, I, I got a, 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 a bear, and then now I'm going to work with the lion. Now I'm going to deal with this giant. So we all start on a very, very small range of primary generational familiar spirits Amen. that know your whole historical background, and they know where all your weaknesses are. They know where all your pride is. They know where all the things are going to get your goat, and it's going to get your last nerve. They know. And if you keep taking the bait, you never progress. You just keep going round and round again. But you know, when you go round and round, you're still in that b balloon he's got you called great grace where you can't get away from him, but also you can't really hurt the body of Christ either until you finally decide you're going to obey him. Amen. So the where the Lord must bring us all the way back around sometimes months or even years later and create a similar situation until we learn how to stand. Eventually, we can't wait to stand so that we don't have to play ring around the road anymore. Lord, whatever I got to do to not go through this same thing again. Eventually, we must stand in faith and trust him. Sooner is much better than again and again. Raise that hand. Lord Jesus, I got a revelation. Sooner is much better for me then again and again and again. I love to tell a story about the guy that kept hitting himself in the head with a hammer. And I said, why do you keep hitting yourself in the head with a hammer? He says, because it feels so good when I stop. You look at most people, they go round and round. Why do you keep doing that? You know, because that now becomes their habit of life. It becomes what's called the demonic bondage. So a mentor, and you know in the scripture, a whole generation took 40 years to die because they couldn't stop going round and round. And then the kids who didn't have the same issues just walked into the promised land. Isaiah says, rejoice therefore in the glory in the Lord, and we learned this morning several times and last week, the glory of God is his unconditional love. That's why all of us, no matter how saved we are, we come short of the glory of God because we, we love everybody, even the people we really love, we love them conditionally. Yeah. And until they come up to how the image we want them to be, yes. we reserve it. Yes. Understand that? 
And there are other people, well, that we don't consider them because their condition is there ain't no hope for them. So we, we pick and choose who we love, but it's conditionally. God does not do that. God loves unconditionally all the time, no matter how whacked you are, no matter how wrong you are. God puts you in the rubber room of grace so he can love you and protect you until you wake up and smell the proverbial coffee with chicory. <laughs> So I'll read it again. It means that those who learn not to be dictated by circumstances but stand in the will of God, that's really what it means to stand. Now, I'm telling you, Mike and Elaine, it's only, it's only the ministry that God gave us, okay? This is, our ministry is far greater than I, I had never had any expectations for it, and we're still doing it. But we're only able to do it because we do not consider the circumstances. We find out what God wants us to do, and we do it, and we don't challenge our willingness to do it by circumstances. This is why we don't, we don't consider things like cost or whatever, we find out where the grace is that God wants us to do, and we do it to whoever and whatever. If God says to do it, we do it. They can be a train wreck. They can be angry. They can be whatever they are. God said to do it. Matter of fact, he even said to bless your enemies. So where are you going to go? Yes. Pray for your enemies. Yes. So it's a matter of obedience. It's not a matter of reason and logic. So you stand regardless of the circumstances. But if you have to get all your ducks lined up first to be able to obey God or stand in faith that God's going to do something, I want you to know the Red Sea is not going to open up. And he will outweigh you. So there is a teaching in the church world that you can praise your way out of anything. I personally believe in praise. It's great. It's wonderful. I get goosebumps. It's a great, powerful blessing. But it can be very mistaken thing to teach people to praise when all things are crashing in around you. Amen. Praise is basically Thanksgiving. You realize that? We wouldn't know anything about praise if, if David wouldn't have been uh, who he was. David in today's praise, you can go all back, all the way to Genesis and go back. You don't see anything about praising God. David, David was a psalmist. David knew all about praising God. And so we have to, that's why we're using uh, David in Psalm 143 to show us how to be able to stand no matter what the circumstances are. Now watch. Well, we can't go right now. Because, you know, it's about to, it's, it's coming in, to, you know, the kid's about to get out of school. You know, uh, my husband's, I don't know, if he, goes, if he goes on vacation right now, he might not be considered from the raise. Let's see, uh, and, and you go all, and, and all of that's in your head, which the Bible says is cornerly an enemy against God. And God's not in it whatsoever. You never ask God your permission. God never told you to go. You don't consider anything. You have no promises of God in your quotient at all. And you wonder why it doesn't work. And then you have to go and say, I tried God. No, God tried you. Is that right? That's right. So it can be a very mistaken thing to teach people that you, all you have to do is praise no matter what's going on. You'll come out the situation with a big tambourine shouting joy. But fighting hell is way more complimented than singing praises to God. I didn't say you shouldn't praise. I'm just saying that's not what you do when all hell's coming out against you. You find out when and where does he want you to stand and stand in faith so you can uh, trust God to be who he says he is. I know my deliverer is coming. 
I know Jesus Christ said that he always causes me to have victory. So we all enjoy praising and shouting and glorifying God. And I believe praise is a great important weapon. But there is a vast difference between praise and standing. So we go back to David in Psalm 143 and he explains how David reacted when caught in a horrible, terrible, no good situation. So David is the one who teaches us about praise and introduces us to praise. Yet in this instance, David said praise was not particularly the answer to his problem. David had to learn something about standing in faith. He had to run head on into the demonic principalities and powers. David involved himself in spiritual warfare that was so deep and complicated complicated that he was not able to fully describe his own feelings. Thank God. Say with me. Thank God for the book of Psalms. When you read Psalms, every human emotion is expressed. Thank God it's okay to have those emotions. Thank God it's okay that you want to kill somebody or you want to jump off the bridge as long as you don't. We're not, we're not held accountable by how we feel. We are account, we're held accountable by what we do and don't do. We're held accountable for what we allow our feelings to tell us it's okay to do this. There is another church teaching that says we are only to confess positive things. <laughs> Listen, when they, when they told me I had inoperable condition and, I was, you know, there's nothing they could do, I was going to die, uh, you know, that sounded like a pretty negative, conf uh, you know, confession to me, okay? So I just answered it with a positive thing, not a positive confession. I asked it, answered it positively with a promise of God Amen. that I will live and not die and I will testify of yes. the greatness of my God. Yes. yes. Say. But me not saying what they said is not, was not going to deliver me and I wasn't going to get healed. What I had to do is speak the word of God to my own body. My spirit had to speak to my soul because my soul was believing their report. Is that right? They had evidence with their scans. And they wanted me to see it. But I didn't want to see the evidence. I wanted to work my evidence. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. So I would put my hope not in what they said. My hope was in what God said. Amen. Raise your hands. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I'm going to live all the way till I die. Till I die. And I'm going to testify of the greatness of my God. And I'm going to eat and drink any deadly thing because you said I could in Jesus name. All right. Got that? Fear is never a good motive to do anything. When you pray out of fear, I question you because you're seeking to save yourself. But when you pray God's word back to him, that's how faith is worked. You take the 7,500 precious promises, you never mention the circumstances, and you think about how great your God is, not how bad your problems are. Oh. Quit rehearsing a curse. Yes. Good confessions and truth are two different things. See, I can make a good confession, or I can speak the truth of God. One's carnal. And does nothing but maybe fake me out emotionally. But the word of God is not only truth, it's life. So walking and standing with Christ isn't mind over matter. It's not a rehearsed talent. It's not, it, it, it's, it's not a craft. It is, the, it is Jesus 
in operation in the life of a believer through the power of the indwelling Holy Ghost. I didn't come back to life because Elaine was trying to encant something. She was tearing that devil up. I still have a broken bone right here from when they beat my chest in trying to get me to breathe. I got a bad habit at night. I touch it and it moves around. I, I go back to that bed. I, 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 I throw my hands up. I, I surrender. Hey, hey, I like breathing better. Yeah. Let's try it again. I will live and not die. And I will testify of the greatness of my God. He's a healer, a deliverer. He's grace, mercy, and truth. And thank God he loves me unconditionally. He'll never leave me, nor forsake me. Lo, he's with me always. He'll never reject me. Yeah, that's going to be my testimony. So David's example in Psalm 143, and that's your homework. I mean, devour Psalm 143. As the man who initiated the concept of praise is explaining something to us. Let's look at it. The steps of the enemy who was oppressing David and the steps David took to escape Satan's attack. I have all these last 50 years done these things every time we were under tremendous attack. Okay. Now, the fact is, I'm still standing I'm still breathing at 75. I'm still moving forward because we're going to stand against the wiles of the devil and do not entertain bad circumstances. That will become your reality. Your reality needs to be your life hidden in the person of Christ Jesus, which is your romper room your balloon bouncy where you can go crazy and not hurt yourself, don't hurt God, don't hurt other people, don't even hurt your witness. But you got to be in Christ. You have no reality other than being in Christ. But in Christ, you have to stop using your feeble mind that's anti-Christ, and you have to use the mind of Christ. And if you don't know what it is, it's everything that's written in your Bible. But it goes better than what you can read with your mind. It's the revelation to your spirit. You want the prophetic, not the pathetic. So there is tremendous emotional, spiritual, and even physical conflict going on. David confesses, for the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life into the ground. Now, this is the word of God. Now, understand, most of these are what's called messianic psalms. These are actually prophetic of Jesus before Jesus ever was born of Mary. So most of the psalms express the emotions Jesus was having, and David was a type of Jesus. You understand that? Okay, he was a king, and he was the least to be chosen. He had all the same attributes as Jesus, but he was a man such as you and I. So David had to be crushed so that we had an example of how to stand under the worst circumstances. Now, let's read that part. Say, for the enemy has persecuted, is persecuted, and probably is going to continue persecuting, persecuting my soul. Now, you notice it's not in your head, it's in your guts. When, many times when we, I, I, the times I lay hands at the altar, a lot of times I call Elaine because usually women are so full of pain that's been stored up down in their, 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 their core. I have to have, because I, I don't touch women, so she'll touch them, I'll touch Elaine, and then when they fall out, they start bucking and jerking where they're being delivered of all of that negative energy that's going to cause sickness and disease and mental illness and emotional illness because it's never been validated and it's never been dealt with. Understand that? that that's true deliverance there. 
See, if you cast the devil out of a person, but that pain and hurt is still there, you really haven't helped them. Okay. So you need a supernatural deliverance of stored up energy that's never been validated that you were really injured and hurt that way and that you never really rolled it over on Jesus. Why don't you roll it over on Jesus? If you roll it over on Jesus, you can shout the rest of the day, right? And oh, with needless pain, we often bear because we just don't take to Jesus in prayer. And we just nurse it and rehearse the curse over and over again. And that's, again, like hitting yourself in the head with the same hammer. You get a little relief after you express yourself, but then you got, you're driven to go to do it over and over again. That's what bondage is. It's a true addiction to your own emotions. Well, the enemy has persecuted my soul, and he has crushed my life to the ground. Because once you feel victimized, you can't fight. You start playing the role of a victim that can't not fight any longer. Working on my doctorate degree, I, 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 I kind of specialized in suicide prevention and suicide dealing with families after suicide. And the suicides I've dealt with, person finally gets to the point where they don't want to fight anymore. They don't want to feel any more pain. And the legal definition of suicide is the ultimate act of self-preservation. Now, let's look at that. If you seek to save your life, you lose it. It's the definition of suicide. And most people uh, self-destruct and destroy their own marriages, their own families, their own jobs, and their own ministries because they have a problem from childhood that they're, they're undeserved of anything that's good because they're, bit, they're so processed that you only get the gold star if you spell all the words right. You only get the candy bar if you brush your teeth and you made your bed. And they're so into that when they can't perform, then they can't receive. And when they receive something that they feel like they don't deserve, they self-destruct over it. This is why employees will always be hated by their bosses if the boss pays them a good salary and a good bonus, and that person knows they don't deserve that pay grade, they will triangulate and hate the boss to deal with the fact that they know they don't deserve the money. You understand that? Because from childhood, we have learned that if you perform well, you earn the blessing. And if you don't earn it, then you don't deserve it. So now we earn nothing in God. We can do nothing to earn God. God wants to give us great grace and mercy, but we know I don't deserve it. And you triangulate on a marriage, on a relationship, on a child, on a wife, a husband, or whoever it is that you, you, you bounce it off so that you can be able to stand yourself and you don't assume all the guilt for the destruction that you're causing. Just telling you, I know what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, the problem is when people are mad at God. There's a thing called a barren womb situation. Little girls are taught, and they give, they, as soon as a little girl's old enough to recognize, you start with a baby doll, they have a baby doll, they imitate their mamas, they, and then they get married, and then they can't have a baby. Well, they either blame their husband, blame their self, but typically, they blame God. And so what do they do? They take it out, that anger that they never deal with on every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Because it's easier for me to take it out on you than, than to take responsibility for myself. Does everybody understand that? So the devil knows if he can come out you, you're probably going to triangulate and complicate, so now, instead of fighting the devil, you fight people. The second you fight people, God takes his grace back. Did anybody understand that? When you decide that people are your problem, 
then you no longer understand the grace God wants to give you to love you unconditionally because now you don't love and you go worse than that. You start hating and wanting to destroy someone else. So God says, okay, we'll play it your way. You want to judge that person and give them no grace? I'll take your grace from you. Now, how can you act in the spirit? You got no grace. And once you have a grudge, once you have resentment, once you start validating those ministries, that becomes who you are. So this is like Paul saying in that verse, knock down, but not knocked out. Say with me, I might be where I am, but don't count me out. I ain't going to be here long. You got that? When they t that doctor told me the second time, he said, you get up off that bed, you're going to die. I said, doc, I already did that. <laughs> I already did that. Now, listen, no. You say, don't count me out because I'm still breathing. I'm still walking. I'm still going to live and live and not die. I'm still going to testify the greatness of my God. I might be knocked down. But don't, but, but don't think that, they, they don't put a period behind that. You got to have some fight in you. It's called spiritual warfare. But you know, before you can fight the devil in spiritual warfare, you got to fight your own soul. Does everybody know that? See, he says... Knocked down, but not knocked out. Verse 3, he has made me to dwell in dark places. Yes, now listen, I'll tell you again, I, I'm degreed and validated in, in a, a, so many things in psychology. I am. I'm not against psychologists. I just don't believe what they do works. Okay, isn't it? Because what they do is they make you focus on how you feel. See? And they focus on circumstances in your history. So instead of forgetting those things that you're behind, you paying them $500 for an hour to point you in the wrong direction, they God said. And they're asking you, so they're going to say, remember when you were four years old. And when you go into that trance, they start giving you false memories with suggestion. Now, you're way off than you, than you were, and plus you're out $400. <laughs> you understand? Now you've got to be on medicine and get shock treatments. <laughs> well, you could have just went and sat in Papa's lap, you know, <laughs> and let him hold you, because perfect love casts out all fear. Let him love you. All the fear's got to go somewhere. <laughs> So there might be a few people who have never walked in darkness, but I think most of us have been in our mind when it's been pretty dark. You know, the devil invented a thing called night terrors. It's called sleep paralysis. I work with, I don't know how many people, where you're sleeping and then you get disturbed and you come out of your sleep, but your body is not ready to stop sleeping and you're totally paralyzed. You can't move. So now what you do, you go, oh, oh, you can't move. And the devil always presents. I've heard story after story. They saw the cloven feet. They saw the, you know, they, they, they start describing the demons because they start hallucinating when it's really just a physical thing. But that sleep was disturbed because they didn't know how to get sweet sleep that's a promise from God. So they went to bed with their troubles, and their troubles caused them not to be able to sleep. Then they go into they can't, and, and, uh, insomnia or night paralysis or night terrors, and the devil has an opportunity to manifest, and they're worse off than if they'd have stayed up all night drinking coffee and chicory and, you know... Walk in the floors over you. <laughs> and the thing is, 
complain about not being asleep, but never tell that devil before you went to sleep, I'm going to sweet sleep sweetly because the Lord said so, and I bind you, you lying devil, you were disturber of my peace. Or you're going to create a habit of going to bed already afraid that you won't be able to sleep. So let's look. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. This is David still talking, Psalm 143, 3. We might say, I try to stand and believe God, yet something breaks inside of me and I just fall apart. I've had people come in, I need to see you, I really need to see you. Why? Well, I just, I'm just falling apart. Well, look, that's really an exaggeration, isn't it? Is your nose still where it used to be? Is your, is your ears? Did your hand fall off? I mean, part of you might be sagging, but that's just drag gravity. You, you, you're not falling apart, right? I mean, where are you falling apart? See? And, and who, where did you ever hear somebody say, I'm falling apart? Or did somebody say, my God, it looks like you're falling apart. <laughs> you got to watch out being a victim because somebody else declared you a, or suggested that you were a victim. <laughs> Remember, look, this has already been over 40 years ago. I went to that, uh, uh, I went for a checkup because I was going to sell coffee for standard coffee. Uh, 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 and I had to go get a checkup for it. And I said, they, they made me take my clothes off and put that little sissy sheet on like a little dress. <laughs> And then I had to put my little tiny hiney on that cold steel. I went, oh, my God. And the doctor comes in. And he, he looks at us. Hey, do this. I went. He says, oh, man, you got cupping. I said, what? You got cupping? I said, what the hell is cupping? He said, look at your hands. I said, yeah. He said, you see how they cup? That's, that's, a, that's a precursor to many serious diseases. I said, Jack, I've been here 30 minutes. I've been sitting on this cold steel in this dress. You walk in here and tell me I'm going to die because my hands are cupping? I said, you think I'm paying you? You crazy. I got up there and walked out of there. 40 years ago, look, my hands are still cupping, but I'm still breathing, yeah! And I still got my money. What the heck? <laughs> you ain't making a victim out of me, Cisco. No, 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 no. Now, look. Our spirit becomes overwhelmed when we think circumstances. There is no such feeling thing as feeling fear without first thinking a fearful thing. There's no feeling of victim if you didn't first imagine yourself as a victim. I am a deliverer. Okay. Now, let me tell you what I like about being with the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office. They're the only people other than soldiers in war who run towards danger. That's the nature of being a peace officer. You run towards it while everybody else is running from it. Now, guess what I got? Jesus said, I'm going to give the authority that the gates of hell, all authority of every demon, cannot come against you. Greater is he that is in you than all the devils in the world. So the devil's not your issue. It's your thought life that's your issue. It's your belief that's the issue. My heart, this is uh, 143, 4. My heart is appalled within me. This is when you, you, you don't even like yourself because you made some bad decisions and you find yourself in that. You're sick, you're sick and tired of being you. In other words, David's emotions were just deeply devastated. He was overwhelmed. Have you ever said, Praise God, I felt it dribble off your chin and dripped into the floor when you were praying. 
Maybe you picked up the Bible and read it. It was like the Times Picayune that doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> there was no life in it. So understand again, I am not referring to the normal Christian life, but I'm talking about the times when all hell comes up against you. Thank God all hell doesn't break out all the time. We couldn't stand it, right? God would have to deliver us like he's going to do in the rapture. God chooses to use those times to equip you to teach you how to stand so that you can take more territory from the devil and you can teach others and you can be an example and people can ask of the hope that they see in you. So God says, now after you have done all, prayed, praised, read, prophesied, fasted, listened, Ask the elders to pray for you. They anoint you with oil. You, went, got, you got baptized again. And after you've done all this, now you stand. But you see, we don't, uh, it doesn't make any sense under attack to just stand. Right. But that's where the mystery of faith is. You do the opposite of what is natural. So there comes a time when there is nobody you can really, that really can help you. You must stand all by yourself in faith and trust God alone. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've been blessed in life since I'm 18 years old when I met Elaine. We have been agreeing partners standing against everything. And it's not a day almost goes by where somewhere along the line I turn to her and I say, hey, Elaine, it's you and me, babe, against the world. We'd make a tight circle because as long as two can agree, we can escape anything. Yeah. See? I feel sorry for people that, that stand alone and don't have somebody that can agree with them when they're under the gun. It's a dangerous thing to be. So thank God that he enabled the writers of the Bible to show emotions. Here's Moses. Got the law of God. You know, it breaks. Then he's leading all these people and he's seeing the, the Red Sea open up and all these kind of things and all. But then he got mad and he hit the rock twice. Thank God he hit the rock twice. I don't know how many times I'd have hit it. I'd have had, you know, corporal tunnel because that's the kind of guy I am. I am hot-blooded Sicilian. I, don't, I think people deserve what they, they get. Amen. Understand that? But in the spirit, I can't do that. So I have to discipline myself. But the enemy attacks not only our minds and emotions, but the demonic also often uses friends and relatives and people we work with and next door and across the street. Now, remember, as long as you understand the dynamics, the devil has to, since he's bodiless, he has to influence people with the body to be able to affect you. So now you start blaming the people in your life for your condition. But understand, other people are not responsible on how you emotionally feel. So you can't believe, you can't, your lack of self-control of your emotions can't be somebody else's responsibility. You make me so angry. No, I did a good job of exposing you're an angry person. You make me crazy. No, God allowed me to show you that you, 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 you're real close to needing some serious medicine. <laughs> Understand it? Now, when you stand, you're impervious to everybody's emotions and all their cat calls and all of their victimization maneuvers. So how do we stop the downward spiral? And the answer is revealed in Psalm 143. I want my battle team to come up here real quick. You know who you are. You know what to do. Grab the microphone. I've said all I'm going to say. I'm going to sit down over there by Alex. I'm going to focus on the way God does things in his ways. 
David says in Psalm, in verse 5, I meditate on all your doings. Let's think about the ways that God does things. We know God's ways are not like our ways. How many of you know his ways are higher than our ways? His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We all believe that, but we easily become disappointed when God doesn't do things the way we think he should. We might have said, Lord, here I am, and the devil jumped on you with both feet. So God says, it's okay, just think about my works. And I, I remember a time in ministry years ago, when this very message, when all hell broke against me, I had no idea that God could even allow that much hell to come against me. And I went through a season where, I, just like Pastor said, all I could do was stand. I tried everything else five times. Come on, somebody. And then it would not, and I was just standing. And finally I said, God, I said, I did everything. I fasted. I prayed. I said, why are you punishing me? And I paused, and God said, son, I'm not punishing you. I'm promoting you. And I said, God, you got a strange way of promoting people. But that's how God promotes us oftentimes is through our pain. He wants to see if you're going to stand. So let's think about the way God does things. Amen. And, and it says, we might have said, Lord, here I am, the devil, or I already did that. Well, next one. We should begin to meditate on God's works and say, Lord, I don't really understand why this situation is like this. But I know this, your ways are not my ways. I understand the enemy is trying to oppress me and trying to cause me to accuse you of not being right. But Lord, I know your ways are always right. Even if I don't understand, I still worship you. Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Psalm 105, five, remember the wonders God has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. Come on, let's remember how good God is. Father, in the seasons of darkness, in the times of tri tribulation, Father, we're going to remember the goodness of our God. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God, you always cause us to prosper. All things work together for our good because we love God and we're called according to your purpose. Father, we thank you that we can trust you in your ways, even when we don't understand, even when when we can't see the way out, even when we can't see the hope that you have, God, show us and remind us how faithful you are. Father, your word says your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. In Jesus' name. Listen, some of you, some of you might need this so much, you might want to just come stand at this altar as close as you can. Just as a testimony to the Lord, you're pressing in. You don't have to, just a thought. Amen, amen. And I want to, we're going to move into uh, what David talked about in verse 6. We're going to talk about being postured. And in verse 6, it said, I stretch out my hands to you. And in the Hebrew meaning of this, it says, I stretch forth my hands like a little boy waiting for his father to pick him up. There is no father alive who can resist that. Not a real father, not a real daddy. We got people in our lives that may donate life to us and we come forth. But I want to tell you, we have an Abba father that we can come to. We have a dad. He's a father and he's a daddy. We can come to him and we can stretch forth our hands and we can reach out to him. And look, I want to tell you, he will not resist you. He is a good, good father. It is not by human strength nor human wisdom we stand. It is only by God's grace and power. My soul longs for you as a sun parched land. As a lake all dried up with big cracks appearing, it is being, it is begging for water. This is the process to eliminate the circumstances that are destroying each and every one of us. Instead of focusing on the devil, mm -hmm, you now begin to open your heart to God. God, I remember 
when you healed me and you delivered me. I understand the work of your hands. I understand if I understand if I hunger and thirst after your righteousness, I shall be filled. I understand that I shall be filled. I want to come from this dry and barren place into your presence. In Proverbs 21, 21, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, prosperity, and honor. Let's just lift our hands. Not, not, not these funnel hands, receiving hands. Let's, let's do, let's do the, the hands where we're reaching up to our Abba Father. Father, we come to you, Lord, not focusing on what the enemy has come in and what he's ravished and what he's trying to ravish. Lord, everything that he's stolen, everything that he's trying to steal, every lie that he's ever spoken and every lie that he's trying to speak against us now, Father, we just reach up to you because we know in your, arm, in your arms is strength, in your arms is safety, in your arms is provision, in your arms, in your presence, Father God, we position ourselves to be in your presence. We position ourselves to be in your arms, Father God. And as we are postured up and we're ready, Lord, we know that every dry place, Father, because we hunger and we thirst for your presence, Lord. Not, not, for, not for vindication, but for your presence, Lord, that every dry area will be filled, Father God. Every broken area will be fixed, Father God. And every stolen area will be restored in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I like to always preface before I go, and I like to share Job twenty two twenty eight, and he says, I shall decree a thing, and it shall be established for you, and then light will shine on your ways. So when we do these, this is just not a something we do on a Sunday night believers thing. It's something that we do all the time. One of the favorite things I love to do with the Lord is I love to say, Lord, you said no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You said every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, I can condemn it. So I love it is, as Pastor Mike says, it's the closed circuit with God. Amen. So I just want to encourage you that to always be speaking the word to the Lord in that circuitry. Amen. So mine tonight is on, and I love this. A lot of people would think that this is selfish. It's not. We have a model prayer that David throughout scripture says, Lord, answer me quickly. Amen. So tonight, we're, the emphasis that I'm speaking on is that we're saying, Lord, we've done all that we can do. We need a quick move. Answer us quickly. Amen. So David says in verse 7, answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. In other words, I'm in a situation where you must hear me. We are so glad David was honest with God. Don't we love David's raw honesty? David told God exactly how he felt, so we can also. All true relationships are based on honesty. In verse 7, David says, Do not hide your face from me. We have all prayed to a seemingly empty room, saying, Lord, where are you? And there seemingly is no answer. Are you there, Lord? David knew God was watching his entire situation. He knew God was saying, you must stand. David said, I will stand. I will meditate. I know your ways, God. I know you are the creator. I know you don't let anything come upon my life that I don't need or is not necessary for me to endure. Then he says, Lord, and that's what we're saying tonight, I've done my part. Please come quickly. Hear me speedily. Don't hide your face from me. And God's face we see is synonymous with his manifested presence that brings the feeling, the sensing, and the enjoying of the presence of the Lord. Please, God, I'm standing in faith. Father, I stretch my hands out to you, and my soul thirsts like a dry, thirsty land. Hear me and hide. Do not hide your face from me. Psalm 95, 2, let us enter into his presence with thanksgiving and let us shout 
joyfully to him. Father, we thank you, Lord. We shout, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And Father, we shouted unto the Lord with a loud voice, and he heard me. And Father, we thank you that, Father, we you will move speedily for us. I thank you again that no weapon formed against us should prosper. And Father, you instructed us that when we've done all that we can do, stand putting on the whole armor of God and above all the elements of the armor of God to take up the shield of faith by which we will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the devil. Satan, the Lord, rebuke you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 143 and verse 9, David said, Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I take refuge, not in a cave, not in the wilderness, but in you. Any of us who has gotten into a deep battle with the enemy absolutely want and need deliverance. But that is not exactly what David is saying here. What David is saying is, Lord, I want to come out of this fiery, hot situation clean without the smell of smoke on me. That's why he would declare, teach me the way in which I should walk, for to you I lift up my soul. The normal Christian life is to walk openly in victory with righteousness, healing, and prosperity over our whole lives. I said at Life Church this morning, two things Pastor taught me many years ago. You've got to fight the battle of being a victim victorious and a murmuring martyr. We're to walk in victory because we're walking in holiness and righteousness and prosperity before the Lord. Deliverance without right teaching is a very dangerous thing. We, need for, we know from years of experience that where good teaching follows, deliverance is natural. Discipleship is supernatural. And the walk of God leads to victory over victory with great joy. Psalm 143.10, David said, teach me to do your will. He also says, let your spirit lead me on level ground. David declares, lead me on level path. So when I get out of this mess, I would like for you to adjust my whole way of life so that I don't go through this again. Yeah. Pastor wrote on this document that when we come out, we don't smell like smoke. I think it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who didn't try to deliver themselves. They looked at the king and said, I know that my God is able to deliver me, and even if he doesn't deliver me, I'm going into the fire. I think it was Daniel that said, rather than me delivering myself and not go to pray, I'm going to go to pray, and the lion's den can be before me because standing is not just a posture of a disposition. It's a spiritual position, so he's asleep when the lions can't even eat him. We've got to take our stand, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a spiritual position, not just a physical upright position that says nothing and no one can cause me to move from where God has put me. It's the old adage we used to say, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. When David started praying, he put himself in God's hands. Many of us try to deliver ourselves with our hands. And we're looking for a way out. We're looking for a way of escape. And when God says the way is to stand, if you've been running and you've been hiding and you've been fighting and you've been pushing, tonight's your night to just stand. Pastor invited you to come down here. Maybe some more need to come because we're about to stand. <laughs> Don't miss it. It'd be a shame to go to the parking lot when you could have stood right here. Lift your hands up to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I decree to you that I will not move from where you planted me. Heavenly Father, I promise you that my feet will be firmly planted on solid ground. There will be nothing that will shake me 
that will rattle me, that will confuse me, that will deceive me and cause fear to come into my life. I place my hand under your hand and inside your hand and I stand where you've told me to stand in Jesus' name. I will stand firmly upon your word, firmly upon your will, and firmly in the presence of your righteous way for my life. My life belongs to you. I live at your pleasure. I serve for your glory. I shall not be moved in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you were encouraged and blessed by the word. And if you'd like to partner with us at White Dove, I want to share a couple of ways that you can give to this ministry. First, you can text the letters WDF to 45777, or you can go to our website at whitedove.org. Thanks again, and God bless.